is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon. Always shoot the door. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off, Skip. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical. It's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. Tuesday here on the program. Welcome to it. It's the Steve Gruber Show, 888 999 You can find out more at stevegruber.com. You hear a lot about the culture of rape these days on American college campuses. Places like Rolling Stone do fake stories about it, trying to find some truth out there to this notion that somehow people are running wild. It's more of a targeting of our young men, I believe, uh, than anything else. Is rape a serious problem? Of course it is. Should it be excused in any way? Of course not. But the fact of the matter is, to say there is a culture of rape on America's college campuses is a gross overstatement. Let me give you an example. In a new report spanning 2013 and 2014, the number of rapes reported at the University of Michigan's Ann Arbor campus has doubled. Now, in and of itself, that would sound striking, now, wouldn't it? How many, just think about this for a second, how many rapes do you think were reported at the University of Michigan? They have 44,000 students. 44,000 students. Do you have a number? Anybody have a number? How many rapes? A few hundred? A hundred? Ivy didn't have any idea. Fourteen. Fourteen rapes. That represents three one-thousandths of a percentage point. Three one-thousandths of a percentage point. Uh, am I excusing the 14 alleged rapes? No. But culture of rape on, a, on college campuses? Uh, apparently not at the U of M. Apparently not in Ann Arbor. Uh, alcohol arrest, by the way, uh, grew, or violations, I should say, from 1,234 to 1,429, an increase of 16%. But uh, you have to remember, this is not a fair comparison. In 1975 or 85 or 95, the laws were different when it came to alcohol. I wonder how many underage drinking violations would have been written in 1975 if the laws were the same. This whole notion that somehow we're all running wild and and drunken and, and drunken disorderly conduct and, and rape is commonplace on, on college campuses. I'm sorry. I don't see evidence to support that premise. Maybe you see something different. I do not see evidence to support that premise. Based on 14 rapes at a university with 44,000 students, 14 reported rapes on a university of 44,000. I don't know what would be normal, but it would seem to me that if you went to a town of 44,000, there might be one rape reported a month. I don't know. But it doesn't seem like a culture of rape. Here's a uh, an article that I pulled from from the internet. We're talking about sexuality and so forth. And we've heard these stories recently of mothers giving their children hormones because they identify either as a boy or a girl and not as their biological gender. And some say, some pushing back saying that's child abuse. Consider this letter authored by the president, vice president, and psychiatric consultant to the American College of Pediatricians in response to an article published in Pediatrics Magazine aiming to normalize gender dysphoria, which is the common term for thinking you're another sex, gender dysphoria. 
recognized by the World Health Organization as a mental illness. We vigorously object to the normalization of childhood gender identity disorder, GID, promoted by the American Academy of Pediatrics. The recommendations of the authors to reinforce the, de the delusions of gender identity confused children and to prescribe puberty blocking hormones as though puberty were a disorder are outrageous. This approach violates the oath of all physicians to do no harm. It goes on, and, and, and here's another portion of it for you to consider. A recent 30-year study in transgendered adults in Sweden, unquestionably a transgender-affirming culture, should give the AAP and American Psychiatric Association pause. It showed that individuals who underwent sex reassignment surgery suffered significantly greater morbidity and mortality when compared with matched controls. Shockingly, their suicide mortality rose 20-fold, 20 times above the comparable non-transgender population. The authors concluded our findings suggest that sex reassignment, although alleviating gender dysphoria, does not suffice as a treatment for transsexualism. So let me ask you, I mean, as, as we watch parents give children hormones, hormones to block puberty, is that child abuse? Is that going too far? I know what I think. What do you think? 888-900-9966. 888 And as we're working our way through the palm, you know, I've got so much to go through here. I've got... Headline after headline. How about this? Patriotic teenagers in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, showed up at class Wednesday last week waving American flags in defiance of educators who canceled America Day over fears it might upset students who don't consider themselves to be American. This is in Wyoming, not Connecticut, not Massachusetts, not California. Administrators at Jackson Hole High School pulled the plug on America Day, citing concerns that celebrating the USA would alienate some of their young people. Activities director Mike Hansen said that a number of students did not feel American and felt targeted and singled out by this day. Of course, they're in an American public school, in an American city, enjoying American benefits, in American classrooms, in American teachers, in American friends, families, and subdivisions, going to American supermarkets and enjoying everything that is America, but they don't feel American. My ass. I wish I could say what happened in Jackson Hole was an anomaly, but... It's unfortunate that many other schools around America seem to be doing this more often than not. And good for the kids that went and waved the red, white, and blue. But Principal Scott Crisp at Jackson Hole High School in Wyoming said this. Our homecoming activities are to bring our students together holistically as a student body. Well, what kind of gobbledygook garbage is that? It's America, pal. You live here. You work here. You were born here. What a bunch of idiots. I digress. Triple eight nine hundred ninety nine sixty six. You gotta fight back, folks. I know it, it'll wear you out, but you gotta fight back. Otherwise these folks are gonna, you know, the hippies are in charge of the asylum. Keeping you in touch with Michigan and the world. It is 18 after the hour. If you hadn't figured this out yet, the socialists are on the move. The socialists that have been abject failures in Russia and China and Cuba and Venezuela, North Korea, and the list goes on and on and on. The communists, the Marxists, are on the move. They just don't see, they just don't get it. They're delusional. Well, this time it'll work. Capitalism's evil. Uh, those leading the charge, the United Nations which intends to replace capitalism and free enterprise with its green economy. And, may, and if you think this is by accident, go back and look. 
Karl Marx and his tenets of his beliefs uh, focused on Earth. Earth Day, the green economy, all of that was a, was a tenet of Marxism. This is nothing new. This is not like it's not like the green movement is suddenly something new and exciting. It's not. Karl Marx had this figured out more than a century ago. But its concepts, uh, you know, these fringe ideas come from the Great Depression, the United Nations Sustainable Development, as most re- recently promoted the UN's 2030 Agenda Conference in New York. Blatantly promises to end poverty everywhere, provide work with dignity for everyone, lifelong education for everyone. It's like Bernie Sanders and his delusional freight train, his, his, his circus, have made it everywhere. Patrick Wood is author of Technocracy Rising. Joining us now, Patrick, welcome back to the program. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me back. You know, you know this whole, you know, people don't realize, but this is, a, you know, if you go and read, you'll find that um, environmentalism, is one of the tenets of Marxism. It's one of the ways to get people, well, we have to do X, Y, and Z. There's certain things in the world that if they control, they control you. Uh, the farms and fields being one of them. Am I right? You're absolutely right. The uh, The whole movement for sustainable development, people need to realize, is that this is an economic movement uh, more than it is a political movement. Uh, the, the phrase sustainable development talks about economics. And these people actually intend, this is the United Nations and all the, the, the hundreds of NGOs around the world, and governments are, are co-opted into this thing now. Um, all of these people intend to implement the sustainable development system uni- uniformly around the world, and they intend to take over the means of production and consumption. Absolutely. Now, let me, let me go through a, a short list here of of a few items. The United Nations uh, Division for Sustainable Development published in 2002 a guidebook to the green economy, exploring green economy principles. It delivers sustainable development. It delivers equity, which is the justice principle. It creates genuine prosperity and well-being for all. That's the dignity principle. It improves the natural world, the earth integrity, planetary boundaries, and precautionary principle. It is inclusive and participatory in decision-making. That's the inclusion principle. It is accountable, the governance principle. It builds economic, social, and environmental resilience, the resilience principle. I mean, I feel like I ought to have, you know, Orwell... Uh, looking over my shoulder, uh, you know, and Newspeak ought to be just you know rolling off my tongue because this is such garbage. It's just Actually, such garbage. But the fact of the matter is, we have such uneducated people. They will, they will march down the conveyor belt into the grinder just like they do on the wall. Go. This, this is what's happening, and I have to say, George Orwell is looking over our shoulder because when he wrote 1980, uh, 1984. Uh, he was looking at tech, historic technocracy back from the 1930s. This is all this stuff is today. It was the whole genesis of the sustainable development stuff can be seen in the technocracy movement in our country from the 1930s. And Orwell was looking at that movement when he penned the book 1984. Aldous Huxley, the famous author of Brave New World, also was looking at technocracy. He wrote that book in 1932 which was when, uh, almost exactly when the technocracy movement was moving in to occupy the basement of Hamilton Hall at Columbia University in New York City. This was the sad thing to talk about back then. And they got the picture. They looked at it probably for you know a little bit, and they said, ah, we see where this is going. This is going to be a scientific dictatorship. And lo and behold, here we are. Yeah, it, it, here's the thing, though. Whether it's the failed so- Soviet Union, the failure of Marxism and communism in China, or Venezuela, or Cuba, or Vietnam, or North Korea, and the list goes on, um, socialist, Marxist, Stalinist policies fail. And they fail to the tune of 125 million people killed. It's a gross estimate of the gross inequities of socialism over the 20th century. You know, from Pol Pot to Stalin to to Chairman Mao, hundreds of millions of people paid with their lives for this uh, experiment that doesn't work. You're right. And you know what they say, though, Steve? They say, well, we've had some failures, but the reason we had failures is because we didn't have 
enough of it. We didn't have enough total control. So the United Nations now says, as it's just got done passing its 2030 agenda uh, just last week, where, where the Pope came to speak to the United Nations, uh, they say basically, well, we're really going to get it now. You know, we, we're we going to accelerate this whole thing. We're, we're going to have more sustainable development now instead of less. And you'll see, when we get complete coverage of the whole world, everything's going to be just great. That's insanity. But we know better than that. We know better than that, Patrick. And the question is, how do you stop it? Because you have Bernie Sanders and Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, American politicians, leading American politicians, championing the, this sort of nonsense, this sort of failed thinking. They, they just don't get it. The American people are starting to get some of it. Not, not everyone, for sure, but more and more people are getting it. And in the end of it... I'll tell you, people, America is going to have to stand up and just say flat out, no. You know, my, my heart was tickled yesterday that in the Dominican Republic, uh, hundreds of people are ripping the smart meters off the sides of their homes and throwing them in front of the utilities office. They're an abject rebellion against the smart grid movement in their country because their race got doubled. Delivering Michigan common sense with a big dose of truth and honesty. Thirty-three after the hour on a Tuesday. It's the Steve Gerber Show. Thanks for dialing it in. Really appreciate it. If you'd like to join the conversation, you're encouraged to do so at triple eight nine hundred ninety nine sixty six. Triple eight nine hundred ninety nine sixty six. You can also go to stevegerber.com. Post up questions for me that uh, we'll read here on the air. You can listen live with the Listen Live button or go back and peruse interviews that we've done here. and uh, Or go back and go through an interview again if you hear it the same day and go back and listen to it. Our next guest, our next guest has uh, written a new book. It's called Big Lessons from a Small Town. Big Lessons from a Small Town. And um, it comes from the Michigan Attorney General Bill Schuette. And uh, Bill has um, been involved with public life here in Michigan for a very long time, former congressman, uh, attorney general for the last uh, several years, and uh, is going to be joining us here in just a moment. But yeah, it always makes you wonder if he's writing a book, what is next on, on the uh, horizon politically for for him. Uh, there's a forward in the book by Michigan State head football coach Mark D'Antonio as well. So you can get an idea. But it always makes me wonder when you're writing a book, what uh, is next on the agenda? Bill Schutte, welcome to the program. Hey, good morning, Steve. Nice to be with you, and uh, thanks for taking a moment to talk about this book I've, I've written, uh, Big Lessons from a Small Town. Very nice of you. Thank you. So what is the small town? Uh, for, those, for those that don't know, what small town are we talking about? I was born in a little town in smack dab in the heart of Michigan called uh, Midland, and that's where my Wife and I, uh, we went to the same bus stop, grade school, junior high and high school. Our kids went to the public schools in, uh, in Midland, Michigan. And I learned a lot of uh, big-time life lessons from some life coaches, some of whom, you, you know, people might know the names, you know, uh, George Bush and Jim Baker, but the other names of Al Quick and Frank Altimore, uh, some football coaches and football friends that were kind of life coaches that I learned about adversity and how you respond from it, and working hard, and these are, you know, basic values that I think we all are aware of, but uh, practicing them all the time is hard. I'm not perfect at it at all, but so I wrote this book about the lessons I've learned. So the book is, uh, it's out now, correct? It's uh, about 24 hours fresh. We launched it on Sunday, and, and uh, you know, I've it's about uh, sometimes, you know, humility, sometimes uh, make sure you know what you don't know. And I remember the first time I uh, planted corn in a big, huge tractor with a farmer friend, and I got off the, the, the tractor, later later gave a speech that night, and kind of bragged about uh, planting my first ten rows of corn, and there were a lot of snickers in the audience. And the, later the <laughs> farm couple pulled me aside and said, listen, Bill, you're going to be okay uh, representing agriculture in Congress. You're a quick study, but you can't plant 10 rows of corn with a 12-row planter. 
So you, you, have to, you have to know what you don't. You have to know what you don't know, Steve. And you sometimes that only, uh, you know, got to get rid of the bombast and, and some of the, you know, bragging and make sure you uh, you're on listen uh, and uh, learn before you go go on broadcast. Yeah, because people will ask you about the numbers at some point. There's no question about that. So uh, you have spent a, year, uh, a lifetime in public service. You're uh, a member of Congress and in other places. You've uh, made your mark. You've also been the attorney general here for the last several years in Michigan. Uh, but obviously, um, uh, sir, when, when you write a book like this, people say, now what's next for him politically? So the obvious question is, uh, what's next for you politically? Uh, we've joked, you and I, about you running for governor, but I... Obviously, it's something that people would consider you a, a very well-qualified candidate to do, and it must be something you consider. Well, I, I appreciate your encouragement. Uh, uh, sometimes people read too much into uh, something you do, so I've, I've written this book, which is a four-and-a-half-year endeavor. You know, sometimes life would get in the way. Our children would graduate from high school or enter college, and or there'd be elections or life, vacations, graduations from college, what have you. So it took four and a half years because my first responsibility is serving as attorney general and my family and, and you know, politics sometimes gets in the way. But, uh, yeah, it was a four and a half year effort. So uh, this is simply, it's not an autobiography, not a memoir. It's just lessons I've learned. And so I hope that uh, whether you work for a nonprofit, maybe you on the local Big Brothers, Big Sisters board, these lessons of service and leadership, which is all about relationships, hopefully they'll come in handy and, and uh, uh, people will, uh, maybe somebody will learn from it. And uh, uh, it's just an opportunity for, for me to pass some uh, lessons on from uh, uh, the landscape of Michigan and across the country uh, from, you know, presidents to football coaches to CEO I've learned. Well, maybe it'll be a big hit, you know, you know, uh, Hemingway, you know, got a lot of his inspiration, you know, from northern Michigan. So maybe you're the next... Uh, <laughs> Maybe you're the next Hemingway here, Bill. I mean, let's let's talk about you know your. Uh, no, I, I, you're, again, uh, you're you're very being <laughs> gracious and polite, and I love Hemingway and read all his books. I love the Nick Adams stories up in Michigan and all of that, and and uh, our, our family enjoys Hemingway. But no, this uh, this will not be a New York Times bestseller. But uh, um, it's it's a way for me to talk about the strength of family and forgiveness and uh, lessons in humility and, and uh, things like that. I mean, George Bush taught me the importance of writing thank you notes, uh, doing them. They're much more impactful than writing an email. So uh, I, agree I remember with that. one time make, making your own phone calls is another part. Um, Dick Cheney called me personally on the phone, and an intern answered it when uh, he called and almost swallowed his tongue when uh, it was uh, Dick Cheney was calling for Bill Shooty. So, you know, there, there are little lessons about going the extra mile that are important, too. Speaking of the Bush family, you're a big supporter of Jeb Bush, uh, obviously, and, uh, and and people know that. How do you, uh, looking at politics real quickly, uh, how do you think that effort is going here in Michigan and around the country? You know, I feel real good about uh, where Jeb Bush is. You have to earn this every day, Steve. No one should ever... Uh, give anything to you. You know, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't waltz into running for governor. You shouldn't waltz in running for president. You have to earn it every day. Jeb understands that. There are 16 candidates out there, Steve. It's, it's like a Mad Max movie. 16 people enter, one person leaves. Remember Tina Turner saying? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so the fact is you kind of earn it all the time. And, and uh, there's been the summer of Trump and, you know, there's kind of seasonal candidates of the day or of the month, so to speak. And, you know, there'll be another debate coming out here shortly, and I think a few other folks will kind of drop off then. And, and the fact is, uh, uh, is the pace quickens, a few will fall, as my football coach used to say. And so, you know, the pace will quicken, some will fall. I think Jeb Bush will go the distance, and because he has a conservative record, uh, cutting taxes and putting money away for rainy day fun and had a very imaginative creative scholarship program, school choice program in Florida. So I think he's got the issues on his side, and I think he has the stamina to kind of go the distance, so to speak. Yeah, I only have about uh, 30 seconds left here. We're on the line with Bill Schutte, Attorney General of the State of Michigan, new book, Big Lessons from a Small Town. Uh, but real quickly, a, a new bill out there, House Bill 4138, that would uh, make it easier for some low-risk offenders to be paroled earlier to take some of the pressure off Michigan's correctional system. Uh, I only have about 20 seconds for that, uh, but what do you think about that uh, provision, that bill? I'm strongly opposed to automatic release, catch and release, that lets violent criminals 
uh, be released earlier than their uh, determination by judges. Uh, I think we need to make sure we have public safety as the uh, number one and the prosecutors and the Department of Attorney General, law enforcement, we're opposed to early release of criminals. I think it endangers and jeopardize safety of communities. I think it's wrong. Always leaving us wanting more, Attorney General Bill Schutte, because I could sit here and this, have this conversation with you for the next hour. I appreciate the time, sir, and, and, and best of luck with this new book, Big Lessons from a Small Town. It's our Attorney General Bill Schutte, everybody. Thank you, sir. Hey, thanks a lot. Being very gracious. Thank you, Steve. Getting your day started with news from around the state and around the world. Common Sense Radio. This is the Steve Gruber Show. All right, welcome back to it on a Tuesday. Moving right along, you know, a, a, a big list of guests today. Uh, our next guest, a, a regular who hasn't been here in a while, State Senator Rick Jones of Grand Ledge here joining us uh, this morning. Senator, welcome back to the program. Good morning. You know, a lot to get through, so I, I figure we better get quick to it. You know, this debate over benefits for you know state employees and, more importantly, their significant others. Now, obviously, over the last few months, a lot of debate in this country about same-sex marriage and different things. Wouldn't it just be easier? Wouldn't it just be easier to say this? The employee gets insurance, and anybody else, whether it's one person, two, three, four, whatever it may be, you pay for? Wouldn't that be the easier way and, and the most appropriate thing to do for taxpayers, or am I just out to lunch? Well, I think you're going to see most county and city governments going to that. But back under Governor Granholm, uh, when we did not have gay, lesbian marriage, she decreed that any live-in boyfriend or girlfriend would have full state benefits. Now I see absolutely no reason for it. Everybody can get married. And whether you agree with it or not, that's the fact of life. So I'm saying to the state employees, if you want state benefits, put a ring on it. Well, here, here yeah, well, if I, okay, I can live with that. But here's my point, because I'm going to go with what you just said. Why should the taxpayers, I, I can I can live with the fact the taxpayers are on the hook for the employee, and this won't win me a lot of friends out there, um, but why are we, I mean, at, at my private company, I have to pay in money for my family uh, on my insurance. Why shouldn't, uh, you know, the same be true for state employees? Well, it, it doesn't matter to me. You know, it may, we pay for the employee, anything else is above and beyond, and you pay for it yourself. That should be the, po I mean, we can't just afford... Uh, to continue to pay and pay and pay for people that aren't even state employees, I don't believe. I understand what you're saying, and uh, the governor has made at least uh, partial moves in that direction. Every state employee, including your legislators, have to pay 20%, and I'm sure that someday it'll be higher. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it will be. Um, the other big topic that you're here to talk about this week, so we'll keep an eye on what happens with that, because I think you're right. Put a ring on it uh, at a minimum. But I'm saying even putting a ring on it shouldn't qualify you for state benefits. I'm saying that uh, we cover the employee, and, and that's where it ends. Um, the other big uh, topic here, and it's something that I have a pretty good um, idea on, is fish farming. I mean, and here's why. I have learned through my reading and studies that fish farms that are, you know, basically a fish farm is nothing more than a net that's set up, say, in the ocean, for example, where you have captive fish that uh, can mingle, if you will, through the fence with wild fish. And the problem is captive fish have a disease rate higher than those that are, you know, free swimming fish. Therefore, you have a possibility of infecting the wild population with diseases you would not normally see. And with that in mind... You have introduced a bill that would ban fish farming in the Great Lakes, which I applaud you for because I think that is a very good idea. Well, I was shocked to find out from the Michigan United Conservation Club and Michigan trout fishermen that they were proposing allowing net farms out in the Great Lakes. Now, a net farm with 200,000 fish produces the same amount of waste as a city of 65,000. We all know what happened down in Lake Erie when they got too much phosphorus. They had algae blooms. Toledo couldn't drink their water. I don't want to see us experiment with Lake Michigan and all the other Great Lakes. Let's keep them pure. In fact, the Michigan Constitution requires me as, as a senator to protect 
the natural resources of Michigan. That's what I intend to keep fighting for. Well, you know, and it, these are very simple things to understand. When beaches get closed in Michigan because of contamination from, say, E. coli, that E. coli, the number one source for E. coli, are, are, are can of the geese. You know, the, these geese come and they foul the water with, well, what geese do, right? And so you talk about 200,000 fish in a pen, it's going to foul the water. It's going to make a, a stink, if you will. It's going to make a mess. It's going to unbalance the ecosystem. What kind of support are you getting? Well, I have quite a bit of support, but uh, unfortunately there are uh, so-called fish farmers on the other side that are really pushing for this. Uh, they want to change it. The, they want to make it like the, an open range, you know, that they can go out in the, to the Great Lakes and do anything they want out there. And I think it's very inappropriate. We're going to have fish escape. Uh, they'll compete with the other fish. And right now, 15,000 people are employed uh, for the sport fish industry in Michigan. And they figure seven billion dollars is what the fishing industry produces for the Great Lakes. Why would we want to jeopardize that for a few corporate farmers that want to raise trout and salmon and sell them to the expensive restaurants? I, I think it's a huge experiment with our natural resource, and and I will push back every way I can. Let me ask you this: You've got eight states that border the Great Lakes. So you have the eight governors of the Great Lakes. So, you know, the big states like Wisconsin and Ohio and so forth. What are the what are the positions coming out of these states? I mean, the way to make this the most effective, because if Michigan bans uh, fish farming and Wisconsin doesn't, what have you really accomplished? Well, hopefully it'll wash up on their shores and not ours. But uh, the only fish farms in the lake are near Canada, Ontario, and they haven't issued new permits in about 20 years. I think they realize there's a risk, and they've decided they don't want more out there in the lake. Do you have any idea what the governor's position might be on this one? I haven't had the opportunity to talk to him personally, but uh, uh, certainly there are an awful lot of sportsmen's groups out there that say, let's not mess around with Mother Nature. Well, you know, I think that it's, uh, I think you're on the right track here. And the reason um, I support you is just because of the studies that I've re- read about farming in the, in the ocean and so forth. Senator Rick Jones, always a pleasure, my friend. Keep up the good work. Have a great day. There you have it. It's the Steve Grew Show. Senator Rick Jones will be right back.